Well, this is Project Shift Weekend at Valley for our whole Valley family. As we were asking, uh, last week we talked about just asking everyone in the Valley family to pray about uh, and see just what the Lord wants them to do in response to shifting to Poughkeepsie to make more room as as our services are really filled to total capacity uh, here in Hopewell. And so we're going to be filling those cards out together uh, in just a little bit in our service, but just want to make mention Uh, of that. Some of you may not have been here last week. You can pray right now while I'm talking uh, so you can fill out that project shift. Great challenges that we have because our church is growing so rapidly uh, in in such a big way. Well, this is week number three in our series that we're calling Playlist. We're looking at in this uh, month of February, not so much love songs, but songs about love. And uh, we've heard some great feedback about just the impact that this is making because it applies to every single one of us, uh, these messages messages. And uh, this song uh, this week that I want to look at, uh, it kind of interesting. Let me give you the backdrop of kind of how I heard about this the first time. It's a country song. It's actually a big hit right now uh, on country music stations. And uh, in January, middle of January, Uh, My daughter Brooke and I took a road trip together. She just started an internship uh, down at Disney, and so she needed a car, so I gave her my car, and uh, we drove 20 hours down to Orlando, from New York to Orlando. Daddy-daughter road trip, 20 hours. And so you can imagine we got to talk about everything possible, and one of the things she asked me, she's like, Daddy, this series you're doing called Playlist, what songs are you doing? I said, well, I'm still thinking about that, still praying about it. And she said, here's a few I was thinking of. And so she started just kind of being the DJ uh, in the car, playing all kinds of songs. And I'd heard this song we're going to look at today before, but then she played it for me. And uh, man, one of the lines in this song just hit me so hard. I I would say really kind of rocked my world. And uh, and I decided, yeah, that's a really great one, Brookie. Uh, So, so I'm going to do a whole message about that, and I want to share that song with you right now. It's by the the duet group, country group, Dan and Shay, and actually Kelly Clarkson joins them in this, Uh, and this song is called Keeping Score. So we're we're going to play right now what's called an icon video. We didn't have a lyric video uh, for this one that we found, but it gives the icon so you can kind of understand what they're singing about, what they're saying, And, and then I'll be back and we'll unpack this song together called Keeping score by Dan and Shay. Let's listen to it right now. Man, that's a good song. That's a good song right there. And uh, when my daughter Brooke played that for me as we were driving down 95, I-95, I think we're in North Carolina somewhere, maybe South Carolina at that time. And, uh, you know, she played a bunch of songs and we're kind of listening to them, talking about the words to them and all. And uh, I had my sunglasses on And I'm glad I did because, uh, boy, that one line hit me so hard. Uh, I know I'm only human, don't know how many sunsets I have left. And I don't want to ruin this moment by wondering what comes next. And so I had my sunglasses on. I'm glad I did so she couldn't see that I'm crying as I'm driving down the road. (laughs) Uh, Number one, I was just missing my wife, Susie, and... uh, you know, I, I just really love my wife, and uh, we're, we're going to be celebrating in the summer 29 years of marriage, and I got married because I wanted to be with her. I wanted to be with her every moment I possibly could, and, uh, and I don't take a lot of road trips without her, and, and down in South Carolina there, you know, with only about 15 hours behind us, uh, I was just missing her, and then, and then uh, this line came up. I'm only human. I know I'm only human. I don't know how many sunsets I have left. And, and, I, and I realized, you know, I'm in my 50s, and uh, my mom died in her 50s. And, you know, I've, I've been to the doctor recently, absolutely nothing wrong. I'm, I'm real healthy, but I just don't know how many sunsets I have left. And it just struck me that uh, That line, because my mother died in her 50s, I'm 51 right now, she was 52 when she was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, I don't know, it just just framed things out for me in a very different and powerful way, this whole idea of no more keeping score, and and so that's what I want to talk about. Uh, I want to talk about forgiveness in the context of this message uh, by Dan and Shay and Kelly Clarkson, 
uh, about no more, no more keeping score. Spend a little less time keeping score. And, and if you have your Valley apps, if you'll go ahead and open them up, because we're going to look at a lot of scripture today about forgiveness, because I think this is something that on a regular basis, these are some of the basics we just have to go back to, and it's so very important uh, that we keep our hearts tender and not hard toward other people, and the way you do that is through forgiveness, not keeping score about the faults of how someone else has hurt you or what they've done to you. That applies in marriage, that applies in parenting, that applies in friendship, in family, in, in every area, in church. No more keeping score. Uh, look, look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talking about love, and, and uh, uh, we unpacked a lot we have through this series about love. Uh, I want to just hit on some stuff right now just in terms of review. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4, it says, Love is patient. That word love right there is, is the word agape. It's pretty interesting. It's used almost 300 times in the Bible, in the New Testament, agape. Uh, it's only used outside the Bible in, in terms of historical literature. We can only find three other times this word's ever used. But over 300 times in the New Testament. Because agape is, as we talked about last week, unconditional love. That's perfect love. That has nothing to do with the person. has everything to do with the one who has the love. God loves you unconditionally. He loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. He loves me and there's nothing you can do about it. And, and so here, this word agape is used over and over in 1 Corinthians 13, talking about love. And it says love is patient. Agape. This is the kind of love we're supposed to have for one another. Very interesting in the context. 1 Corinthians 12 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the body of Christ and how we all as Christians are placed in the body of Christ in some place. And, and then 1 Corinthians 14 is all about spiritual gifts. It goes into spiritual gifts a little bit in 12. Right in the middle of it is 1 Corinthians 13. And the whole thing that God's saying here to you and to me is this. You can have all the spiritual gifts. You can speak in tongues. You can prophesy. You can heal the sick. But if you don't have love, if love is not motivating it, it's worthless absolutely worthless. I know a lot of, you know, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost people uh, that, you know, all kinds of great stuff, and they're mean as rattlesnake Christians. And, and it's like, we just have to start living the Bible for some folks. It says love, agape. This is what God expects from us as his followers, as his children. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. A lot of times we hear this in weddings, right? This, this red. And it's kind of poetic, but God's saying more than just poetry here. It does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others. Love never does. It is not self-seeking. Selfishness is the opposite of love, agape love. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Get angry easy, you're not loving people. It keeps no record of wrongs. Doesn't keep score. No more keeping score. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It goes on and it says, it always protects love. It always trusts. It's not skeptical. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love, agape, unconditional love, the love that we've received from God that he wants us to pass on for those of us who are married to our spouse, for those of us who are parents to our children, friends, even enemies. When Jesus says love your enemies, the word is agape, unconditionally. We need it supernaturally. It's the only way we get it. Love never fails. Agape never fails. When a relationship fails, any type, it's a failure to love. And so let's go back here just one more time, because this is so important. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And just that's what this song I love it so much about. It's like, you know what? I need to do a little less keeping score. A little less keeping score. Refusing to keep a record of wrongs is a clear expression of God's love and forgiveness towards someone else. I just refuse. I'm tearing up my list of all the bad things that you've done, all the ways you've hurt me. I'm tearing it up. 
So often people say that they love each other, but as soon as one uh, gets angry or, uh, you know, there's an argument, psh, out comes the list. Well, remember back in 1997 what you said to me? I, I know it's 2019, but I, I got it right here in writing. It's in my memory. That's not love. That is not love. Anyone, anytime the scorecard comes out, you're not loving that person. Anytime, anytime it flips up in our minds, it's a failure to love. And ultimately, could I put it this way? Biblically, every sin is simply a failure to love. Every single one. The moment I get self-centered, the moment I'm full of pride, the moment you know, I, I think about myself and I don't think about someone else, every sin is a failure to love. And that's why it's a really, really big deal to God. And, and so uh, accusations fly in the, in the heat of a disagreement or an argument. Painful memories are drudged up. Uh, this is not love. This, this, is, this has nothing to do with God. This is not love. This is the way people who reject God treat each other. But not as followers of Jesus Christ. We're not supposed to treat each other, and we're not supposed to treat others this way. And so this is brutally practical, this passage here. Like I said, poetically, read it a lot of weddings. I, I've read it in wedding ceremonies, you know, that I've officiated as well. The couple say, oh yeah, what's that love stuff in the Bible? Can we read that? But generally, I go over it with the couple, what that actually is talking about. No record of wrongs. True godly love forgives and refuses to keep track of personal slights. And keep a record no more keeping score i love that about this song by dan and shay and, and kelly clarkson and, and so first statement i think when we talk about no more keeping score i think is real important is this the focus of love is not one's own pain but the needs of the other the focus of love real agape love unconditional love that god we receive he, he's bestowed upon you and me. He's poured out on you and me. And he wants us to disperse to others. The focus of love is not one's pain, but the needs of the other. But when we, when we know that, that someone else has hurt us by what they've said, and we pull back, that's a failure to love. It's a failure to love. And so the idea of keeping uh, no list of wrongs directly connects, really, it's not the only time that this is talked about, but it directly connects with uh, uh, the other teachings and writings of Scripture that are inspired by God. The Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, spoke and inspired words that he wrote, uh, not only in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, but in other earlier spots in 1 Corinthians and it was very interesting that he actually um, spoke about disagreements and disputes in the church of Corinth, Christian to Christian, that had gotten so heated that they were actually bringing lawsuits against each other. And he speaks into that situation these words about love that we just read in 1 Corinthians 13. And look at what he says earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, just a few chapters before this, about these lawsuits that Christians are bringing against one another. 1 Corinthians 6, 7, he says, The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. In other words, he said, the very fact you're suing one another, you're defeated because you're not loving one another. You, you, really, you, you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. You really don't love the way God's commanded us to love each other. He said, why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Do you realize what he said right here? Paul is actually at this point where, where the Corinthian Christians are like, I'm going to get my pound of flesh. You did me wrong. I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to sue your pants off. I'm going to take everything you own. Paul actually says, it's better to be cheated than to be unloving. It is better for someone to swindle you out of money than to treat them in an unloving way. Our love is so temperamental, isn't it? That's not the love of God. And that's not the way he wants us to love one another. In fact, it's better to be cheated than to begin to act in an unloving way toward another Christian. It's powerful. Powerful. L let me put it this way. I'll just share this and see how this fits. 
for you. You can say, oh, you're crazy, Greg. That's okay. You're not the first person to say that. When my wife and I got married, our wedding, August 18th, 1990, I made a vow to her for better or for worse, richer, poorer, sickness and health, till death do us part. I give you my vow. And I've said this to Susan. She said it back to me. She can cheat on me if she wants to. I'm not going to divorce her. Because my vow is not only to her to be faithful to her, it's to God as well. I'm going to love her unconditionally to the best of my ability. And that's what I receive from her as well. So many, so many Christians get married and like, I love you as long as you don't do this, 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 and this, and as long as you do every year this, 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 and this. That's completely conditional love. Temperamental love, that is not the love of God. Marriage is unconditionally. Yes, the Bible says that there can be divorce in the case of adultery, but God does not command a divorce must take place. In fact, Jesus said the reason God allows it is for, because of the hardness of a person's heart, that they fail to love the spouse that cheated on them. That's Jesus said that, not Greg. <laughs> That's Jesus. It's better to be cheated than to be unloving. That's the clear teachings of Scripture. That, that shows how far, like, our culture is so, so far below the level at which God talks about love, how love is supposed to be us one from another because of what we've received from Him. Look at what Colossians chapter 3, different book in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. In other words, the scripture says there are no scorecards that you should ever keep against anyone. No one. Why? Because God tore up the scorecard that he had against you and he had against me through Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's why we forgive. Not because someone deserves it, not because they've earned it, not because they've said, I'm sorry for what I did. We forgive just as God forgave us. All over, I'm sorry, and over all these virtues put on love. That's the only way. And this is, again, the word agape. Put on unconditional, supernatural, divine love that God gives you by his Holy Spirit as a follower of Christ, which binds them all together in perfect unity. In perfect unity. That's what God wants from you and wants from me to tear up that scorecard we keep in our back pocket. (laughs) Why? Because he tore up the scorecard of my sin against him. Not because I earned it, not because I deserved it, because he loved me and he gave his son for me. And he loves you unconditionally and he gave his son for you. That's the premise, that's the basis of forgiveness. How God forgave me, so I I'm supposed to forgive others, so you are supposed to forgive others. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. It's powerful. And over all these virtues, put on love, put on agape. Every day, make that decision. We're going to be talking about that in our series that you saw about SWAT, spiritual warfare in Texas. We have to, uh, spiritual warfare and tactics, we have to put on the armor of God. We have to put on love. Every day, God, I choose to love unconditionally. Sometimes I just have to say that every morning while I'm praying. God, I choose to love unconditionally because you love me unconditionally. Obviously, now let me just clarify here. Obviously, we should not allow people to continue to hurt us or or abuse us. That's not what's being talked about here. It's not putting ourselves in harm's way, but it's not allowing, watch this now, the harm in our heart Call bitterness to continue. That's why we have to forgive. Not, not to stay in an abusive situation or where someone's toxic. That's not what's being said. What's being said is what's going on inside your heart 
inside of my heart when someone has done, done me wrong. That's where forgiveness, that's what really counts is in our hearts. And so that, that's not love. That's not the teachings of love is just to continue to allow yourself to be abused, you, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, beat up on or, or something dreadful like that. No, but it's remove yourself from that, that location, from that situation. But more than that, allow, allow forgiveness to remove the pain that's been inflicted in the heart, in your heart because of that abuse. The goal, really, is to have a spirit of reconciliation, a, 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 a spirit that is forgiving and seeks forgiveness when we've wronged other people. And isn't that funny? We keep the scorecard of what other people have done for us, but we never keep the scorecard of what we've done to everyone else. And there is a scorecard there, too, but that's what God destroyed. That's what he tore up on the cross. And so it's letting the past stay in the past real practically, to say the least. So, so let me ask you this question. Do you have an ax to grind or, or are you burying the hatchet? Ax to grind is I'm going to get mine. Man, I hope, I, you know, I hope they get struck by lightning. I, they're going to get theirs, pound of flesh. That's an ax to grind. Like we're literally grinding the ax. We're sharpening it up because we want them to feel pain. Are, do you have an ax to grind? That's bitterness, resentment. Or are you burying the hatchet? Love keeps no record of wrongs, for we forgive as Christ has forgiven us. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You know, the problem with bitterness is this, and I, I, you might have heard this quote before too. I, I just want to show it. I think it's so true. Bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. That's what bitterness is. That's what unforgiveness is like drinking poison and thinking it's going to affect the other person. Unforgiveness and bitterness in me, listen, you can distance yourself, you, you, can, you can remove yourself from that uh, abusive relationship, but if you don't allow through forgiveness that bitterness to be removed from your heart, they continue to abuse you in the present when really it should be in the past. You continue to feel the pain of it because we choose to hold on and to harbor bitterness. Bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It doesn't affect them at all, but it kills us from the inside out. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, 22, we've looked at this recently, I think last year in 2018, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother and sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, and, and I spent a whole message with this. You'll remember, you know, I talked about the, the yardstick and all, and I broke the yardstick. God says, Jesus said, there's no measurement. There's no measurement. Remember, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. So he, he's not talking about, or 77 times there. Uh, he's not talking about math. He's talking about throw away the measurement. There is no measurement. Peter thought he was being pretty cool and full of pride, like, should I forgive somebody seven times? Because that was more than what the, the teachers of the religious teachers of the day said. It's a lot more seven times than what they taught. You had to forgive at least that many, and then you could be bitter. And, and Jesus plays off and goes, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. He's like, it's not about math. It's not a number. It's throw away the measurement. Throw away the measurement. Because bitterness is affecting you and I today. When we hold on to unforgiveness, it hurts us. And it hurts all of our relationships as well. That's what love does. Love keeps no record of wrong. Love forgives. God forgave you in his unconditional agape love. God forgives me as well and that's how we're supposed to relate to those who hurt us that's why G jesus came that's why god sent his son to pay the price while we were still in sin to pay the price so real quickly now how, how do you know if you're forgiving someone how do you know if you've really really forgiven somebody well there are four stages i think that are really important 
that, that we can kind of walk through, we can kind of mark off, we can kind of measure how are we doing in terms of forgiveness. And here's the thing I know, I, you know, we're not comparing battle scars, I'm not going to show you my scars or anything like that. Every one of us, is, if, if you live on this planet for like any amount of time, you've been hurt. There's not a person right now, and hearing in mind what you have, you've experienced some sort of hurt, some sort of pain from someone else. It's the way this world is because of sin. And so I think it's important to be able to measure how are we doing in terms of our forgiveness, you know, the stages of forgiveness. Now, here's the thing I know. The Holy Spirit is so personal and so powerful. Even as I've been speaking right now, and you're listening to this in Poughkeepsie, at our Poughkeepsie campus, or online at your home, or maybe you're jogging or driving or something like that. Yeah, that person that, that keeps coming to your mind that you're saying, oh no, he can't be talking about blank. I'm not talking about him. The Holy Spirit's talking to you about that person. That's the person you need to forgive. Yeah, that, that right there, that one right there. Yep, they just flashed across your mind. That's the one. I don't know that story. I don't know that situation. God does, and he's saying, listen, I want you to be free. I want you to be free. Free from that bitterness, that unforgiveness that is continuing to trip you up because of something that happened weeks, months, years decades ago and you're allowing that person to continue to hurt you put the past in the past through forgiveness so four four stages of forgiveness and just think about that person right now and where you are in these stages of forgiveness the first one is when we really begin to forgive someone there's a new thinking there's a new thinking you know when someone hurts me uh i feel like it didn't fair i got mistreated they did something wrong to me. And, and you know what really happens immediately? I draw a kind of a mental picture of that person, like a caricature. And it's never complimentary. You know, and I get this mental picture, and I'm sure all the time, maybe this is just me, I'm sure they meant to do it. There's no benefit of the doubt, because I'm hurt. It's like they, they had to have known what they were doing. They, they had to have thought that through. They probably for weeks have been thinking about just, just, just making that little remark right there. And, and it's like our mind all of a sudden begins to vilify, and if I could put it this way, demonize even that person. But when we begin to forgive, all of a sudden we say, you know what? This is a, a, a person who's imperfect just like I am. And we make that decision, I choose to forgive. The first thing that happens is a decision. It's not a feeling. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a decision. And so the first thing is there's new thinking. That unfair mental image, that caricature, where we only think about this person in terms of the pain that they caused us, and they, begun, they begin to be, watch this now, one-dimensional. They're just flat. It's like a cartoon, just one-dimensional. And, and so the first thing is we choose, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to look at this person just one-dimensionally, just through the pain they caused me any longer. And then here's the second thing. There's a new feeling. Feelings follow decisions. Boy, you get in a world of trouble in this life if you follow your feelings. You make decisions based on your feelings. Feelings will falter all the time. That You can't be trusted. But feelings will follow decisions, especially when we make decisions toward what God wants for us, the way he wants us to live. So the first thing is there's a new thinking. Second thing, there's a new feeling. A new vision brings a new feeling. Gradually, my attitude towards that person who hurt me is transformed because I've edited that caricature in my mind. Instead of keeping them one-dimensional, all that they are is that pain that they caused me. No, that, that's, that guy's also a husband, and, and he's a father, and he's got friends, and a job, and he's three-dimensional. And he's not some vilified, demonized person. He's a real person. Imperfect like I am. Imperfect like you. But he's a real person. And so I edit that caricature. I have a new feeling as I come to see that person realistically, not in terms of my bias or my pain bias, if you want to look at it that way. 
And so there's a, there's a new thinking, then there's new feeling, and here's the third thing, there's a new surrendering. There's a new surrendering. That third stage of forgiveness is surrendering. With, with the new vision and the new feeling comes a surrendering of my right to get even, my pound of flesh. Instead of sharpening my axe, I'm burying the hatchet. There's a new surrendering. You simply give it up. I, I'm no longer trying to get even. I'm no longer trying to, I'm no, I no longer find myself desiring that bad stuff's going to happen to them because of the pain it caused me. That's not forgiveness. And so first, there's new thinking, then there's new feeling, then there's new surrendering. And number four, then there's a new blessing. Where we actually, this is how we know forgiveness is really blossomed in our hearts, is that we can actually pray, God, I ask you to bless that person who hurt me. Bless that person who disappointed me. Bless that person who caused me pain. That's the fourth stage. We can actually pray blessing. The process of forgiving is fulfilled when I can want good for that person who wronged me instead of evil. You know, and, and something inside of us says, well, that's not fair. They hurt me whenever we're hurt. They say, that's not fair. Let me tell you, it's not fair, but let me tell you something that's even more unfair than that initial pain. There's something more unfair. Should you choose to be haunted by the memory of that pain that you didn't deserve so that it continues to cause you pain weeks, months, years later? That's not fair to do it to yourself. Is it fair to have to listen to reruns of that pain in your memory over and over and over and over and over again? Is it fair to, to feel the physical breakdown of your body because you weren't built to carry resentment and your health physically begins to fail you? That's not fair. That's why we've got to forgive. We've got to surrender. New thinking, new feeling, new surrender, new blessing. See, the way to really be fair to yourself is to use God's way of being free from the hurts that you don't deserve. And God's way is one word, forgiveness. That's love. God's love, his unconditional love, and his forgiveness are tied together. We receive it, that's what we need to extend to those who hurt us. So let me ask you a couple questions. Who are you keeping score on right now? Listen, let's, let's be real. I, I've, I've talked to parents that they become embittered at their five-year-old. They're holding stuff against their five-year-old. They don't even know what he's doing. But it's so easy. We just keep score on all, ton, a lot of us have scorecards on a lot of people. Who are you keeping score on? Your mother or your father with whom you're, just, you're, you're living a lifelong conflict right now? Your spouse, whom you blame the most for your unhappiness, as if uh, one person could ever make someone else happy? It's not their fault. They're imperfect too. So are you. So am I. A child who keeps breaking your heart? A colleague, a friend, a neighbor, a, a fellow church member? Don't look at them right now. Don't look at them right now. Just look up here. Look up here. There's a better way to heal your hurts that you don't deserve. And that's forgiveness. See, here's the thing. Let me, let me just kind of summarize this right now. The biggest healing takes place not in the person receiving forgiveness, but in the person extending the forgiveness. That's the biggest healing. When, when, when I choose to forgive... New way of thinking, new way of feeling, a, a, a new surrendering, and a new blessing. When I choose to forgive, it frees me up and it brings healing to me, irregardless of the other person, whether they respond or they don't, irregardless. It frees me up. 
The biggest healing takes place not in the person receiving forgiveness, but in the person extending forgiveness. So, this, this whole song by Dan and Shay, I, I, I know I'm only human, don't know how many sunsets I have left. You know what, I'm not perfect, not at all. You can ask my wife, you can ask my children, you can ask the team, staff that works here at, at the church, I'm not perfect. But you know what I've determined is this. I, I've prayed for many, many years. God would give me 80 years and I'd make them count for him. But my mom died in her 50s. And if that were to be what happens in my life and I don't have a death wish, you know what I'm living for? That my wife and my kids and my friends, my family, they'd say, you know what? Greg wasn't perfect, far from it. But man, Greg in his 50s, that was the best Greg. That was the best Greg we knew. That was the best dad. That was the best husband, Greg in his 50s. And if God's so gracious that I see a few more sunsets into my 60s, I'm gonna live my life that way as well. Not keeping score, but that those around me closest to me would say, boy, Greg in his 50s was something, but Greg in his 60s. Now, that's when he really, really was a different guy. See, I think you're the same way as I am. I, I want to live in a way that people closest to me become the people who are the most grateful for me. It's, it's way too easy to fool the people at a distance and to hurt the people that are closest. I want to live my life in such a way that the people closest to me are the ones that are the most grateful for me. Instead of people far away a distance think I'm great, but those around me, psh, he's not. Not at all. See, people become truly grateful for who you are when your life is characterized by humility, by forgiveness, and by love. No more keeping score. I'm going to ask right now, would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's so easy to keep score. The scorecard that we have on those who have hurt us, those who have disappointed us, those who have let us down. But Father, we thank you that you tore up the scorecard that you had on each one of us through your son's sinless life and his life that he laid down as a sacrifice on the cross. And he paid the price for my personal sins and each one of our personal sins and rose again. Father, thank you for your forgiveness and may we extend forgiveness to those around us and no more keep in score. Lord, that we would think new we would feel new. We would have a new surrendering. And Lord, we would even be able to bless those, ask you to bless those who have hurt us. Lord, we can't do this on your, our own. We need the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you. He's available to each and every one of us as followers of Jesus Christ right here, right now, today, that today we can allow the past to really stay in the past Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness and the power of forgiveness and love that we can extend to others. And right now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to give you an opportunity. If you've never prayed and received Jesus Christ as your Savior, he lived, he died, and he rose from the dead for you to pay the price for your sins. The Bible says that if we declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so right now, I want to just lead you in a prayer. If you've never prayed before, and this is a, a prayer that I just ask you to open your heart up to God right now and declare with your mouth, Jesus is, is, is my Lord today, beginning today. And, and I believe he, ra he rose from the dead. And the Bible says you'll be saved. You're forgiven, not because you deserve it or earn it, because of Jesus' sacrifice and God's love for you. 
So just repeat this prayer after me right now. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. I turn from my sin now and I receive Jesus Christ. Jesus be my Savior. Jesus be my Lord. I ask you to lead me, guide me, direct me by your Holy Spirit from this day forward, and I will follow you. Amen.